Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining me on the Startup Societies Foundation podcast. We're joined by a really amazing guest. It is His Serene Highness Prince Michael of Liechtenstein. Prince Michael, thank you so much for joining our show. Uh, thank you and good morning, everybody. It's really unique um, that someone that's so close to an actual special jurisdiction comes on this show. So I think it would be first, it'd be great to talk about for people who aren't as familiar. What is Liechtenstein? Liechtenstein is one of the smaller, but since a long time, sovereign countries in, in, in Europe. Um, we have a surface of about 165 square kilometers and close to 40,000 uh, people living in, in Liechtenstein. Just as a short description, it is, uh, most of it is the Rhine Valley with some of the high mountains and, 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 and rocks around. Uh, we are a high, highly industrialized country, and we are in, in share of people working in manufacturing. We have the highest share in Europe. In general, we have um, industries, uh, we have an economy, which is a high value added e economy, and we have also one of the highest GDP per capita in the, in the world, and especially in Europe. But well, that wasn't always the case. Uh, in the 1960s, there was actually quite a bit of an economic depression in Liechtenstein. What caused this upward trajectory? Well, I think the, the economic problems were as a bit before World War II. I think in the 1950s already it started to, uh, to, to increase. You know that there were different things. The, the European factors that, that, that Europe war, was rebuilt, but also in Liechtenstein, uh, Liechtenstein had, uh, has a very well educated, disciplined, diligent, and hardworking uh, population. It has also a very liberal economic order, and there is a, a very strong political stability. And with stability, we don't mean stagnation. Stability in our things means that there is, is a lot of progress, economic progress, etc but in orderly, inside orderly institutions. Now, one of the principles of Liechtenstein was also, we didn't ha want to have two big government institutions, but rather strengthen the, the private sector. There was also a very, uh, I would say, um, prudent and wise stewardships by, uh, by, by the ruling princes of, 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 of the country, who also, was were driving the uh, development. So this very good relationship also between the monarchy and the population was another success factor of Liechtenstein. Yes, it's a, it's a very unique part of Liechtenstein, besides being one of the smallest countries in the world and having one of the, the highest GDP per capita in the entire world. It also has a, a fairly active monarchy. But beyond that, starting in 2003, they even had more innovative forms of governance that is making it even more competitive. Can you please comment on what were the constitutional reforms in 2003? Well, uh, this, this was, 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 was a development over a, a, a number of, of years, etc. Our constitution dated back to the early 1920s, and there was a, a rework of the constitution which was actually also very much driven by the, uh, by the, by the, the, the ruling prince. And I think there were two very important elements in there. And, and what was very important is the, which already, the already existing strong direct democracy, the actual uh, monarch who is taking up the real responsibilities of head of state, uh, but also the democratic legitimation of the, of, of the, of the monarchy, because uh, this um, was also done that the constitution also foresees measures where an orderly base, the monarchy could be discontinued, um, but in orderly base and, uh, and, and over um, constitutional way. And then another very important element was 
the high autonomy of the municipalities. And actually, also in an orderly way, every municipality could decide by uh, a number of referendums actually to leave the state of Liechtenstein, um, to leave the, the, the state of Liechtenstein either to make an own country or join one of our neighbors. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is open. All these factors make it very efficient that the government has really to see that government policy satisfies the needs of the citizens. And it's actually seen also in our country very strongly that government is less of an authority than a service to the, to the state, especially to the citizen, not to the state, to the citizens, sorry. No, that's amazing. It, it, it allows for a, a authority to to make decisions in the case, it'd be the prince having veto power over the legislation. But there's that safety valve of the communities if they want to, through self-determination, to, to leave. Um, that's sort of a, a competitive pressure on both the princely family and on the government to provide the most competitive governance possible. The, uh, the, the, this, this is true. And I think it, it, it could also be quite interesting and would take away a lot of tensions in, in, in other areas if the possibilities, let's say, of a peaceful separation could be given and in an orderly process and not in a momentous decision. You know, you make today, let's say, a referendum and you say yes, and then you might be compelled to do another referendum two years later to see if you still really want it. And uh, let's say uh, certain rules like that could also have made life easier with issues like Brexit. Yes, I was just about to mention that. Do you think that a Liechtenstein model can sort of help in other European countries that are feeling tensions from, from continuing on in the European project? I, 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 think, I think it would be because I think that um, the adherence to a community should always be voluntarily and, and not forced. I think this is, this is very important. Now, if we look at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the European project, I think this was also at the beginning the intention that it is not, let's say, a centralized union, but it is a framework where uh, the countries could work together for all things which is much better done together. And the first idea in the European Union was the common market and the four freedoms. And I think no, and no, nobody would, and this brought huge ad advantages to, uh, to, to everybody. And it forces actually this way of making, let's say, separations not too difficult. It should also not be, certainly be not too easy, but, but uh, uh, too difficult, that ways are found where um, people of, let's say, different economic structures, different uh, 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 social structures, uh, different history could have a common framework. Excellent. And there is a lot of benefits to, to the European economic area in the common market. How does, how does Liechtenstein fit into that whole puzzle? Well, you know, for us, uh, we are member of the European economic area. That means together with Iceland and Norway. It means that we are what concerns the four freedoms, the, the freedom of exchange of goods, services, people, and capital, that we are part of, of the union, but we are not part of the political union. So we, so, so, so we don't participate in European elections. Uh, we, we, we don't have a commissioner, uh, but, but we profit from this uh, four freedoms. We also have the same obligations as the members. We, we don't only have the advantage, we have, we have also the obligations. We could say the downside which we have in that not being member, full member of the body is that we are not um, uh, part in the decision making. But it would be difficult and it would be maybe also be difficult for the other ones to accept small countries with us as an equal partner in decision making. So I think for the three countries of the European economic area, this is a, this is a very good uh, arrangement. We, uh, we are in, yes, we have the free trade, we have the, the, the free exchange, we are, we are not part of the um, European Union. 
Liechtenstein has on top uh, the advantage, which was very important, the close relationship with Switzerland. And also Switzerland is not part of the European Union. We do have a free trade zone with a uh, free trade zone and also a monetary union with Switzerland. Excellent. And that's another interesting aspect of being such a small jurisdiction is that you normally have some sort of partner government that, um, that small jurisdictions uh, work alongside. Monaco often works alongside France. Singapore often works alongside China or Malaysia. What is the relationship between Liechtenstein and Switzerland? Well, we have since 1922, when let's say after World War I, the, the Austrian Empire collapsed, uh, with whom we had a, traditionally a very good relationships we turned over and went into a relationship with Switzerland, which was very beneficial for us. Uh, Switzerland was a very tolerant and very uh, friendly partner. I think it was a partnership good for both sides, but certainly more important for us than for, than for the large partner, uh, Switzerland. We must also say after World War II, we had the privilege to be between two very friendly countries, Switzerland and Austria, so uh, we could also really put our foreign policy on one side on the neighborhood po uh, policy, second side the, the, the European way, and being a member of the United Nations also have one foot into the, in, in, into the global context. Excellent, and it, it, it seems like it'd be a good fit considering that Switzerland is notorious for having its own semi-decentralized system through the Swiss cantons. This is right, because we have one big similarity with Switzerland. It's a very strong direct democracy. And we, we also do, do referendums. And you see, like in Switzerland, also the autonomy of the can cantons and also, also the principle of subsidiarity works. So also the role of the municipalities are very strong. Uh, we have that, um, uh, that basically as well. And you know, this, uh, this subsidiarity principle has the advantage as many of the important decisions are taken on municipality level, the citizen is also a lot more engaged in politics. So this, this principle of subsidiarity, um, it has a lot, it harkens back to a lot of, of Germanic polities um, in, in, in Switzerland's history or Northern Europe's history such as the Hanseatic League or the Holy Roman Empire, is there some elements of, of the European Union that, that can adopt this sort of principle to at the same time keep these, these free and fair market principles while at the same time uh, bolstering self-determinism? I, I think the principle of subsidiarity it should be one of the most important elements of the, of the European Union. Because I think the strength of Europe is the, is the variety. And, and there are different specializations, there are different societies, there's a different history. But th there is also a certain common uh, European uh, spirit. And I think one of the strengths of the European Union could be also an internal competition. And the internal competition one can only have if the principle of subsidiarity is uh, taken very seriously. And it would also be important, not only on the level between the, the Union and the national states, also more subsidiarity in certain of the, of, of the, of the national states. It, it would help and, and would make the whole system more uh, efficient. And I think one of the uh, big mistakes which the, uh, which the European Union could do is to uh, have too much harmonization. And there's lots, a lot of discussion of harmonization. To have too much um, uh, centralization. And what must, I think, be avoided and which uh, states, if we look in history, there is always a certain tendency away from a decentralization from subsidiarity principle to a more centralized bureaucracy. And I think in Europe, we have to be careful not to go further on a way, and I'm afraid we are there, to go from a decentralized democracy to a more centralized bureaucracy. 
Interesting. Do you think that there are some some indications that this this change of of centralization and these 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 rigid norms when it comes to to nation states are starting to change, whether it be Brexit or whether uh, 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 statements about Greenland, do you think it's moving the needle a little bit in the direction towards subsidiary and uh, into centralized principles? And I, I hope at the moment, I, I don't um, see t- uh, t- too much of that. For instance, this idea, which also the French policy is at the moment, of having uh, a common uh, ministry of economy, I think would be pretty detrimental because there would be a lot more economic planning uh, instead of um, of um, competition. So I'm I'm a, a, a bit careful with that. And the argument that one says that because there is a common currency, the euro, it needs also a common um, economic policy. I don't think this is this is uh, this is very convincing because. Um, Actually, in my opinion, a currency should serve the needs of, uh, of the economy and, and, not, and, and not vice versa. And we, we, we should not forget, I think that the euro is a fantastic idea. I'm very much in, in favor of the, of the euro. I think that the big problem uh, which exists is that also in too many harmonized laws and um, and regulations don't allow enough competition, which might allow, let's say, economically weaker countries to have maybe less regulations and staying a bit more economic, but still having a stable currency, the, the euro. So, so there the, the could be some quiet, uh, there the, the are quite good ideas. The second problem I see, and it's maybe deviating, uh, uh, with uh, the euro when it was introduced, there were certain criteria set, like the debt, deficit and debt criteria, and they were simply ignored. No, absolutely. It, it, it seems that the European Union has really great principles, but it needs to allow what, what made Europe such a thriving economic power, which is the power of competing smaller jurisdictions. Do you believe that in the 21st century, in this economy of highly networked states, that small jurisdictions like Liechtenstein have an advantage? Well, I I think, yes um, um, uh, yes and no. I think there there are small jurisdictions like Liechtenstein, they are much easier to adapt and they can uh, can adapt uh, quicker. Now, the larger countries could do the same if they have more more subsidiarity. Then it would also be be delegated uh, down. Now there are also, and, and we have to see that, there is maybe worldwide, maybe with the exceptions of the US and China, no country is totally sovereign anymore. We are part of groups of larger and, and smaller groups. And the smaller you, you get, like Liechtenstein, the strate- strategy is also a lot of being flexible and flexible in, the, in that adapting rules which are set, let's say, on, 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 on global, on, on European, on regional level. That's true. Um, there is uh, different layers of autonomy and authority, and a lot of it is mitigated between big hegemons like Russia and the United States and China. And it seems right now that Europe is in an inflection point between two hegemons, the United States and China. United States offering the traditional NATO alliances and China offering economic growth through the Belt and Road Initiative. What do you think should be Europe's response to this new hegemon uh, and their new Silk Road? Well, I think Europe and actually the European Union would, um, could offer the, the ideal structure uh, First, it would be uh, important that there is is a global trade policy. There is a a global trade policy, and this is something which which the the European Union tries. But I think uh, it, but it also needs uh, political strengths, and unfortunately, it needs also a certain capacity 
to defend itself. And there, I think uh, Europe is um, pretty weak. Um, first, it's important to, to, to keep all the, all the trade routes, which uh, sometimes need um, help and the security of trade routes, uh, security of market, but also the, the, their, their, own, their, their, their own security. Because defense, which is not only uh, having tanks and fighter planes, etc., which, which might be necessary, but it's also issues on the hybrid side, very good um, uh, structures for cyber defense and also civil protection. Enough uh, food for the crisis, medicaments for the crisis, crisis plans, etc. These are areas where, unfortunately, uh, Europe is um, is pretty weak in, 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 in this context. And you know, if we only look this whole crisis ar around uh, Ukraine, et cetera, and the role of Europe there, we are in Europe about 500 million people. We have these countries, uh, this, um, the, econ uh, the economies together, it is the, the largest economy in the world. The Americans have about, I think, 360 million, also strong employees. The Russians have about 160 million. And now this 500 million Europe's need the Americans to defend themselves against Russia. It's not logical, it's not logical. And this gives also Europe a certain weakness in international affairs. Then Europe has very strongly, and I'm not against values, I'm very pro-value, but a very much value-driven foreign and international economic policy. But unfortunately, in international relations, uh, interests are as important as values. And uh, due to certain weaknesses, uh, Europe is not necessarily able at the moment to really defend its interests and needs uh, the, the support of the United States. But th that means also that, um, that uh, Europe cannot act as freely as, as it might look. I think, again, for Europe, it is very important to keep this close association with the North Atlantic Association with, with, with the United States. I think this is a very essential part of, of Europe because the constitutions and, and the way of living, it, it's all very similar. But Europe is also part of the Eurasian continent. And, and, and Europe's largest neighbor is, is Russia, which actually stretches from uh, uh, from um, the, the, the borders to Europe, which is in the line between the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea, over to Vladivostok on the Pacific Ocean. So I think Europe has to see this, um, uh, this um, a very important way of looking in, in both directions. Do you believe that uh, working in both directions will allow Europe as, as a single political entity to be more self-determined or will they lose even further autonomy by being beholden to potentially two different hegemons? I think, no, I, I think what, what shouldn't, well, this is, uh, this is a possibility to, to be drawn be, between the two. But this needs, I would say, a certain internal strengthening of Europe, strengthening its economic power, let's say, getting, uh, finding solutions for its debt problem, finding solutions for its overregulation problems, finding solutions for, uh, let's say, um, a, an overburdening regulation system, uh, finding solutions to be more independent and, I would say, more pragmatic on um, in the energy policy and coming to this word uh, pragmatic i think one of the danger which europe might run to become rather principalist than pragmatic absolutely agreed uh, and it seems that many states have been in the absence of agreement or solutions to many of these problems they've started to act independently in relation to china's belt and road initiative in fact, countries like Italy have already signed MOUs um, with, uh, with China and their Belt and Road Initiative. Is this a positive step forward, or is it better to wait until there is some sort of consensus and, and 
Europe as a political bloc is negotiating for Europe as a whole? Well, I think on, on, on trade issues, uh, Europe sh uh, should negotiate as a whole. But I think certain areas, I'm not worried about what, they, what, what Italy is, is doing there. What more worries me is the absence, the political absence of Europe in the areas of the Belt and Road Initiative. Because this is a, a very important for Europe to have as much in influence on the trade routes as the possible partner China has. Not that it's against China, but, it, um, but actually it would need as much European presence, let's say in Central Asia or on the ports of the Indian Ocean as a Chinese one uh, to, to, to be on an equal footing. Because it was, you know, if, if, if you look at the history of the British Empire, it was very important for uh, the United Kingdom in the 19th century to have like a string of pearls, their positions of trade. And it allowed the United Kingdom to have a very good and, and global control of, of, of the trade routes. And something similar, China is now trying. And, I, and it's certainly not in the interest of Europe to be dependent on China on the trade routes. It doesn't have to work against China, but it, it would need to have an as strong presence there. Now, this is each uh, year, uh, and so European countries can make their, 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 their own negotiations on that on ports, etc. But actually for the presence in this area, it would need a common European efforts because any one of our countries are too small for that. No, that makes perfect sense. And if, if there is engagement from both sides, it can be win-win and beneficial. And there's even been some thoughts by other geopolitical analysis, um, such as Prak Khanna, who believes that the Belt and Road, while initially being a China-led initiative, many other independent nation states in Asia are building upon the Belt and Road Initiative, making it a multinational, making it less of a Chinese project and more of a multipolar project. Do you think Europe perhaps can take the Belt and Road Initiative and make it more than just a Chinese initiative and make it a Eurasian initiative? In, 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 in zero, it could. And I think this, this should also be the, the, the objective. Um, what I'm just afraid at the moment that uh, Europe turned itself so, so strongly inward that they will uh, that um, they are not able uh, to, to cope um, uh, to cope with, with these problems. You know, we have a unfortunately a lot of unsolved um, issues in Europe. Now, the issue of um, let's say overspending governments, well, it's not only a, a European issue; it's also an American issue. It's, um, it's also a, a, a Chinese issue. <coughs> but I think uh, Europe itself has become a very protective uh, or protectionist trading bloc. And you know, the US is sometimes protectionist and they say um, the reason for protectionism is our jobs. Uh, Europe uh, is probably as protectionist and for them, it's always consumer protection in Europe. And I think this sort of internal thing, we have a, a good life, etc. We have to protect that. We have to close our borders. I think are a big, um, a big blocking, blocking the possibility of Europe to really act globally. Yes, it, it seems that, that there has been a tightening trade restrictions all across the world in the United States, like you mentioned in Europe, but even places like in, in Japan and Korea are engaged in a trade war currently. It seems that there's conflict about autonomy and trade around the world. In fact, one of the things that you've written about recently is that, uh, that China and, and, and India as a whole is dealing with this problem with autonomy and decentralization. In the case of Hong Kong, China is cracking down on dissidents that are seeking autonomy from things like the um, bills that would uh, bring Chinese um, Hong Kong citizens to China for trial. And India has recently annexed 
the Kashmir region, reducing its autonomy to nothing. Do you think that this is that the um, that the um, that what does this indicate for decentralization and and for autonomous regions throughout the world? Is it a negative uh, push forward or is it positive or mixed? Well, I think um, it. I think and, and things are normally not totally negative or totally positive. But in general, it is if a region has a certain autonomy, and this is unilaterally taken away by, let's say, a central government or a larger neighbor, it is normally quite, um, uh, quite negative. It creates tensions. It, um, it, it creates all sorts of, of, of difficulties. And if, if we take the case of Hong Kong, Hong Kong is, I don't think it's, it's good for China because it, 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 it puts in question whether um, China really wants to, to liberalize its economy. The other thing with, um, uh, with India in, in Kashmir, it shows that India wants to strengthen the central power. I think strengthening of central power might be might look good in a very short term, but it's normally long term rather detrimental. And now doing that in this hot spot where the interests of India, Pakistan, and China meet is, is a very dangerous game. Yes, I think that this this fight in Hong Kong over the extradition bill, it could it could definitely hurt China in the long run. One potential uh, outcome in the short run is could this hurt China's uh, strategy in the trade war with the United States. One of the big things that China's trying to do is they're trying to find substitutes for their exports and try to make new trade negotiations with other states uh, in contrast to the United States. But if they are seen as less of a moral authority, they'll be able to find less trade partners globally. Do you think this will weaken their position in the trade war? I, 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 don't, I don't think so. It might be short term. I think also the, the, tactically it will be used by the, the, the United States. But the unfortunate fact is that in this thing, China is simply too big a market that, it, um, that right. there, there will be real sanctions against it. Just to, to, be, to, 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 be, to be realistic on that. Yeah, that makes sense. And China is more than Hong Kong at this point. They're growing uh, in so many different directions. In fact, even in the area where Hong Kong has thrived, which is now known as the Greater Bay Area, they're having multiple initiatives to grow Shenzhen and other cities around it to even outcompete Hong Kong. Do you think that Hong Kong will just fade into the rest of China, or do you think they will retain some sort of autonomy moving forward? You know, I think that there that, that could be um, different views. I think um, that also for China, purely from an economic and financial point of view, it might be good to have an autonomous finance center, which has certain autonomies, which can uh, do, which can attract monies, which can attract investments, which are going in, in, into mainland China, and which is sort of a, uh, can be seen as a financial system, which is not necessarily totally dependent on politics of a very um, uh, powerful state. And having uh, uh, such a structure on the border can be very beneficial. Now there is, on the other side, there is a, uh, a political issue, and I think not all politicians can live, and all system can live, with this system of one, uh, with this um, structure of one state, two systems. And um, I think what China might be uh, concerned is that Hong Kong would, be a ho would become a hotspot for an opposition against uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the rule of the People's Party in Beijing. Do you think that's particularly likely? Do you think that the Hong Kong protests or because of the long-standing institutions and history of, of common law and British rule? Or do you think it's something that can actually be dispersed in other more autonomous hubs in cities like Shanghai, Macau, and Shenzhen? Yeah, I, I think, well, I, I think it, it can, it, everything can be done. It can be done 
but it would probably be less efficient and maybe there would be also less financing there for China if it's not coming out of an autonomous thing. And I don't think that on the other side, uh, Hong Kong could allow itself to have a too strong Chinese opposition on its country for, simply power, for simple power reasons. In, in a world of increasing complexity, trade wars, and problems with autonomy, should these, should nation states and hegemon, should they be turning to micro states and city states like Liechtenstein and Singapore as world leaders, not just economically, but as diplomatic leaders and innovators in governance? I, I think this is always, um, this is uh, always a, a, a very beneficial because by per se, smaller states don't build a threat to the larger ones. So it's much easier to have neutral situations in, in smaller states where, which don't have. If you look the role of, which is much bigger than Liechtenstein, but in a globally context, the role, the diplomatic role Switzerland played this last 150 years and helped in, in certain conflicts uh, uh, to help. The way also Switzerland, which was a very poor country in the 19th century, to develop to, uh, to, to, to one of the leaders. And small states have to be simply better in, in order to, 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 to survive, because uh, it's also in nature like that. An elephant does not have, need to have specific strategies uh, to survive, but a smaller animal has it. So, this also gives an incentive and actually forces smaller states to be very competitive on one side, but also to keep, let's say, um, their food in the in international relations and they are uh, also providing a certain forum where bigger interests can meet. Excellent. Yes, let's hope for a world of peace, trade, self-determination, and smaller states taking the lead. Um, Prince Michael, thank you so much for joining yep. us on this show. I really appreciate all of your time. And everyone, thank you for joining again on the Start Society's podcast.